I mean, even when we like put fake people on stage, everyone's still taller than me. It's ridiculous. So I'm going I'm to talk about Manny here in a second, but uh, I, I want to start off by saying one of the things that I know we all have in common, and it doesn't matter where you're born, your social economic status, your race, your age, one thing we all have in common is that we're all searching for purpose. I mean, from a young age, we start asking ourselves the question, what am I here for? So, so, so let me ask you, what, what, what is your purpose? What are you here for? I mean, do you know? And unfortunately, many people don't. Well, what's more unfortunate is that many people think the answer to this question is actually found in the answer to the question, what do I want to do when I grow up? And we, ask, we, get asked, we got asked that question a lot when we were kids. We ask kids that question a lot. High school and college age people, you're definitely asking that question right now. Some of you in your 50s are still asking it. What do I want to do when I grow up? I mean, we desperately want to find the job, the occupation, the social status, the position that, that will give us purpose. Well, the truth that you need to know that you will discover, if you haven't already, is that true purpose is not found through a job, an occupation, a social status, or a position. True purpose is not found in being a mom, in being wealthy, in being a lawyer, in being a star athlete, being a husband. And if you try to find your purpose in any of those places, you're going to be so sadly, sadly disappointed. I mean, if you're serious, if you're serious about discovering your purpose, there's a different question you have to ask, and that I have to ask. And the question is, who am I created to be, and what am I created to do? Who am I created to be, and what am I created to do? If there is a creator God, that question can only be answered by him. Now, fortunately for us, it is in the first chapter of the Bible in the book of Genesis. And here's how Genesis starts. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The, the, the writers of Scripture tell us that there's one and only God who is creator God, sovereign God, sustainer God, all-powerful God, all-knowing God, holy God, righteous God, just God, loving God, life-giving God. And I know that some of you struggle believing that or maybe used to believe it and struggle believing it now, and I get all of that. You need to know, the only reason I believe this is because Jesus believed it. And as I've said many times before, any guy who could predict his death and resurrection and then pull it off, I just go with whatever that guy says. Now the writer of Genesis, he, he goes on to tell us how God created everything. And then in, in verse 26 of chapter 1, God gets to the pinnacle of his creation. It says, then God said, let us make mankind, another word, that's another word for humanity, it means man and woman. Let us make man and woman in our image, in our likeness. Now you know this, everything that's ever been created, like anyone who's ever created everything, any, anything, if you've ever created anything, everything that's ever been created had a purpose that the creator created it for. If you've ever created anything, you had a purpose for what that created thing was to do. This is especially true with creator God and with the pinnacle of his creation, which is you and me. This is so cool. You and I, you were created by creator God in his image with a purpose in mind. And you need to know that. You are not an accident. You're here on purpose with a purpose. And how God finishes his sentence illuminates his intended purpose for humanity. Let's make mankind in our image so that they may rule over and that, that phrase, rule over, it actually means a lot of different things. It means have dominion, steward, take responsibility for, govern, care for, love. I, if you kind of wrap it up in a different phrase, the phrase I actually like best that you could substitute in here would be have positive influence. So that they may positively influence the fish in the sea and the birds in the, in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. Now what God is saying that becomes much clearer as you continue to read in the book of Genesis is that we were created in God's image to be God's image bearers for God's glory. We are created in creator God's image, holy God's image, just God's image, loving God's image, righteous God's image, life-giving God's image, to be his image bearers uh, to, and positively influence who and what he cares about, his creation, everything and everyone, to care for, to provide, to steward, to protect, to love, to positively influence because that's what glorifies him and God's glory is our ultimate purpose. Bottom line, if you were to kind of wrap this all up, what God's saying, is, and as you continue to read in Genesis, is that you are hardwired to have influence. 
You are hardwired to have positive influence. You're, hard, you're hardwired to positively influence who and what God cares about. You're hardwired to be an influencer for God's glory. And whether you've ever thought about that or not, you've definitely felt it. I mean, isn't it true that there's something in you that, wa- that wants to make a positive difference in the world? Isn't it true that when you see injustice and abuse and prejudice and darkness and hatred and violence, there's something in you that makes you want to help change it? Isn't it true that you long to leave the world better, better than the way that you found it? Isn't it true that you deeply desire for your friends and family and community and business and your school to be better because of you? Well, what is that? That's God's fingerprint on you. Listen, as a stay-at-home mom, as a plumber, as a teenager, as a single person, as a doctor, as a retiree, you're created, you're hardwired to have positive influence. So are you? Will you? Sadly, the answer to that question is so often no. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to discover some things that prevent us from having positive influence and a few next steps that we could take to start living out what we're hardwired to do. And I hope you engage. I mean, regardless of where you're on your spiritual journey, if it's your first time here, been here many, many years, I hope you engage, not only because of the impact that it'll make in other people's lives, in the world, in your school, in our community, in your family, in our church, in your company, but because of the impact, ultimately, it'll make in you. Because here's what you need to know. True purpose is found through positive influence. True purpose is found through positive influence. The degree to which we live out what we're hardwired to do is the degree to which we discover true purpose or not. And as I said before, true purpose is not found through a job, an occupation, a social status, or a position. True purpose is found through positive influence. Regardless of how young you are or old you are, regardless if you're married or single, regardless of how wealthy you are or poor you are, regardless of how important your job seems or how seemingly insignificant your job seems, you're hardwired to have influence right where you are today. And that means true purpose is available right where you are today. So let's discover how to start living out what we're hardwired to do right where we are today. Now, one of the words that prevent us from having positive influence, the positive influence we're hardwired to have, is the word me. And that's unfortunate because of how many of us live. Many of us live like Manny here with a me mentality. World revolves around me and revolves around my comfort, my happiness, and what's best for me What's convenient for me, what helps me, what benefits me. I mean, we live in a very individual, and I can never say this word, and so I'm going to like only try to say it once a day. Individualistic world where it's all about me. What I feel, what I want, what I do. And then it comes about, when we think about having a positive influence, we all desire to, to make a, you know, have positive influence because we're hardwired for it. But because of our natural inclination to have that me mindset, we conclude, I can change the world. I can change my family. I can change that person. I can change my school. I got this. I can do it all myself. It's up to me. It's all about me. And that sounds super honorable, doesn't it? And as honorable as that sounds, that me mindset is going to prevent you from having the greatest possible positive influence because the root of the me mindset, you know this, it's pride. What is pride? Well, you know what it is. Pride is all about making me the center. The focus is all about me. Making me number one, thinking, thinking it's all about me. And you, come on, you got to understand this. Pride prevents purpose. Pride for prevents purpose because pride kills the potential for influence. Pride prevents purpose. You want to have purpose in life? Pride prevents it. Because pride kills the potential 
for influence. If you truly want to have the greatest you know, possible influence, you have to break away from the me mindset. You have to kill pride. And the Apostle Paul tells us why and how when he wrote to the church, the community of Christ followers in the city of Rome in the first century. Now listen, if you would say you're a follower of Christ, if you say you put your faith in Jesus, what Paul's getting ready to write, it's, not a, it's a non-negotiable for us. This is, this is a non-negotiable. But if you'd say you're not a follower of Christ, trying to figure this whole thing out, you can't even believe you're at church. The only reason you're here is because someone promised you free lunch afterwards. I get all that. I'm so glad that you're here. You need to know, everything that we're getting ready to, I'm getting ready to say, you don't have to apply this. You don't have to apply any of this. But you can apply it even if you don't believe what's written in the Bible is real. You should, I think you should apply it, even if you don't think anything in the Bible is true. I think you can and you should, especially if you want to have positive influence. So here's what Paul says. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, you know, all the yous he's writing to are uh, everyone who's put their faith in Jesus by asking Jesus to be the forgiver of their sins and leader of their life. I say to every one of you, Christ followers, do not, and this is a huge phrase, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. It's called pride. But rather think of yourself with sober judgment. It's called humility. In accordance with the faith God ha- has distributed to each of you. He's saying, as a follower of Christ, regardless, you know, of how talented you are, gifted you are, convicted you are, inspired you are, faith-filled you are, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Break free from the me mindset, from the I got this, I can do this myself, it's up to me. Kill any and all pride within you. Stop thinking it's all about you. And here's why. He goes on to say, for, for just as each of us has one body with many members, And these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Now, Paul is using an analogy to make a point. He's making it really elementary. He's saying, hey, you know how the physical body works, right? How you you have different body parts. You have a neck and an elbow and a wrist and a hand and a torso and a leg and a knee and feet. And you know how each of those different body parts all have a different function, but they're all part of what makes up your one physical body, and they're like, yeah, it goes. He would say, now that you're in Christ, now that you've put your faith in Jesus by asking him to be the forgiver of your sin and lead of your life, the same applies to you. You now belong to a bigger body than yourself. And this is so cool. When we put our faith in Jesus... God's spirit, referred to as the Holy Spirit, takes residence in us. And we are now part of something bigger than ourselves. And the bigger thing that we are part of is the church. And some of you go like, that doesn't make sense. You know, because church is a building. And Jesus and the writers of scripture say, no, it's not. The church is not a building. The church is not a Sunday morning event. The church is a people. And the capital C church, the universal church, is every other follower of Christ, every other person who's put their faith in Jesus all throughout the world. Paul refers to the church as the body of Christ here and other places in the New Testament because he knew that Jesus established his church to be his agent of hope in the world. Jesus established his church to be his physical rep- the physical representation of him today. Jesus established his church to carry on his mission, the mission that he came for, that he died for, that he rose for. Jesus established his church to influence the world by ushering in his love and joy and hope and peace and salvation and redemption and healing and provision and justice and mercy and grace together in such a way that it's transformed, that people are transformed, that families are transformed, that schools are transformed, that communities are transformed, that cities are transformed. This is awesome. As followers of Christ, we together are the body of Christ who are hardwired By God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, to together influence the world for Jesus. As a follower of Christ, that's your purpose, and it's our purpose. This is awesome. When we put our faith in Jesus, we become part of a we that's much bigger than ourselves and much greater than ourselves. By the way, this is what baptism is all about. 
Is the baptism for the individual? Yes, to publicly proclaim and declare that they put their faith in Jesus and they're following Jesus now? Yes, but, it's, it, but the, another purpose of baptism is to demonstrate and prove and, pro, and proclaim that you are now associated with a someone whom you were not associated with before. That someone is the church, God's people. It's, 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 baptism is way more of a we thing even than it is a me thing. It's why it's never done in private. It's always done in public. So if you haven't been baptized, you put your faith in Jesus, come on. Get on with it. Now, it's impossible to practically live out being the body of Christ with every other follower of Christ in the world. And that's why there's local churches, communities of Christ followers who function as the body of Christ in a local context. As a follower of Christ, Jesus has called us to be fully engaged in a body, in a local church. He's called us to be part of a we that form and function as one body. A we that belong to each other. A we that influences together. So you want to live a true purpose? You want to do what you're hardwired to do? If so, according to Paul, as followers of Christ, the greatest influence for me is found in we. The greatest influence for me is found in we, and the greatest influence for me, 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 is found in we. Paul's saying if you want to live with true purpose by having the greatest possible positive influence, you have to break free from the me mindset and get into a we mindset. Paul would say, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. You're part of a we. This is not all about you. Having the greatest influence possible is so much bigger than yourself. Don't think of yourself, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. You alone are not the body of Christ. We are. You alone are not Jesus' agent of hope in this world. We are. Don't think of yourself more high than you ought. We together have the potential for so much greater influence than me alone. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought because it will prevent you from having positive influence that you're hardwired for. Because the me thing, it's all about pride. And pride does nothing but destroy you, destroy others, destroy us. Well, Paul, how do we not think of ourselves more high than we ought? How do we think of ourselves with humble and sober judgment? And Paul's going, great question. I'm glad you asked. And he continues to say, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. He's saying we all have different gifts and strengths and talents. Creator God hardwired us with. And he goes on to list some of the examples that, and what we should do with them. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Period. And then immediately after this, Paul goes to a different subject. Many people get focused on the specific gifts listed here. And that's the wrong thing to focus on because that's not Paul's main point. Paul's not giving an exhaustive list here. He could have went on and on with a lot more examples. He just ran out of ink. I don't know that he ran out of ink. He just was ready to go on to another subject. Paul's main point is we live together as the body of Christ, not by believing together, but by serving together. Or to say it another way, we influence together by serving together. Paul's going, listen, if you're having a hard time Keeping up with this, I'm trying to be as elementary as I possibly can. Let me review one more time. Just like you have a physical body with different body parts, but they all work together to make your body function properly and fully, just like that, you are now part, once you put your faith in Jesus, you're now part of the body of Christ. And each of us have a different gift that makes us a different body part. Some of us are shoulders, some of us are, you know, elbows, some of us are hands, some of us are legs, some of us are knees, some of us are feet, some of us are mouths. You know who the mouths are. He's saying, what, whatever body part you are, whatever talent and gift and strength that you have, use it, do it, serve with it. Your greatest influence and ser- your greatest influence is found in serving someone bigger than yourself, that's Jesus, with a we bigger than ourselves, that's Jesus' church. Essentially, what Paul is instructing us to do is to follow Jesus' example. 
I mean, Jesus, he was the master influencer. He was the greatest influencer who ever lived. He positively influenced people and the world in such a way that it was forever changed. And he did it by being a servant. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. And he served by taking on the lowliest job of washing feet. And then he served as the ultimate sacrifice by dying on the cross in your place and in my place for your and my sin. And Paul would say, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Jesus isn't asking you to do anything he himself did not do. And serving may cost you some convenience, but it cost your Savior his life. The greatest influence from me, the greatest influence from you is found in we. We influence together by serving together. You know, many people who claim to be followers of Christ often try to follow Jesus and find their purpose and influence the world with that individualistic mindset, with that me mentality. The world revolves around us. What's best for me and most convenient for me and helps me and benefits me, what I feel like, what I want to do. When it comes to living our purpose, it's like, I got this. I can do this myself. It's all about me. It's up to me. I don't need the church to know God. I don't need the church to have influence. And in reality, you can believe in God. You can have faith in Jesus. You can have some positive influence without we. But you can't truly follow Jesus. And you surely won't have the greatest possible positive influence that you're hardwired to have without we. And here's why. Because you alone are not the whole body. The reality of it is, is that this is you. As a follower of Christ, you are a body part. Nothing more, nothing left, less. An attached body part that's useful. It's healthy. But an unattached one, it's useless. It can't do anything. You detach an arm and over time it decays and it becomes ugly and gross and stinky. And sooner or later there's nothing left but just dry bones. And I've watched this happen with so many people over and over and over again when they disengage from serving. And sooner or later it's like their faith ends up decaying. And then for some reason, I don't know why and how it happens, but I can see it happen from a mile away. They get all, as they start decaying, they get all critical and all cynical at the rest of the body. And then because they're decaying, they start decaying everyone around them. And not only that, they become unfulfilled. By the way, if you want to be unfulfilled in life, make this life all about you. Because true happiness, true fulfillment, true purpose, it's found in serving others. It's found in giving your life away. So listen, we need you. Well, as a matter of, you need we. I mean, you need we. You don't want to be this. You need we. You need we. But we also need you. We can't be the best we. We can't be the best body without all the me's, all the parts who are a part of the relevant body. We are the body of Christ, of which you are a unique and you are a needed body part. We can't be a fully functioning, healthy body without you. You can't have the, we can't have the greatest possible influence without you because we need our left arm. I mean, we can still operate without our left arm. We can still make some influ- have some influence with our left arm, but we can much, have much greater influence if we've got our left arm. The body needs everybody. The body needs everybody. The body needs everybody. 
So for those of you who are functioning as the body of Christ by serving on a team at Relevant, you need to know as your pastor, I'm proud of you. I'm grateful for you. You, you need to know that you're having a greater influence than you, could possibly, than you possibly could by yourself. Those of you who are serving on our guest services teams, on the production team, on, in, in the band, on our guts team, you need to know you're helping create an environment every week for thousands of people to hear the gospel, to hear the good news of Jesus. For those of you who serve and sprouts and relevant kids and rooted and youth united in our four next gen ministries as a small group leader, as a team leader, as a team member, you need to know that you're helping make an impact in the next generation for Jesus. For those of you who serve as T-Life group leaders, you need to know that you're helping create smaller communities for people where they can be known and cared for and loved. For those of you who serve on one of the teams that keeps the relevant center looking world class, whether it's cleaning or whether it's on the lawn team, you need to know that you're helping make our community better. For those of you who serve on one of our global impact teams, you got to know that you're helping ensure that Korean orphans don't just survive, but that they thrive. For those of you who serve on a, our social media team, you need to know that you're helping ensure people that people hear and people see a message of hope every single day when they open their phone, when they look at their tablet, when they're getting on their computer. And I can go on and on and on about every single team. Whatever team you serve on, you're a part of marriages being transformed, families being transformed, Transformed. Eternity is being transformed. You're part of, the, part of the transformation stories that we tell week in and week out. You're part of helping people be transformed into everything that God's created us to be. So don't forget what you're doing. Don't forget through your serving, however big or small the, you know, the significant you think the team you're serving on is. Don't forget what you're doing. It matters. It matters. That being said, some of you who are serving... And I'm so grateful for you, so proud of you. Some of you, though, I just need, you know, you need to narrow the focus a little bit. Because some of you are trying to be multiple body parts still. You're trying to be a shoulder and a knee and a foot and an arm and a mouth. And listen, we don't need more mouths. <laughs> well, Paul would say, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. You are a body part you're not the whole body. Trying to serve more than you have the capacity to do, it prevents influence because you can't give your whole self to it. I was recently talking to a good friend of mine who's been a part of Relevant forever and has served in multiple capacities, multiple different teams, and I'm so grateful for this person, and this person continues to just serve a lot of different areas all over the place, but re recently this person is just is not, is not feeling value, is not feeling like they're having influence and I'm, I ask this person, do you feel like you're giving your full self to any one team? And they're like, no, because I'm all over the place. And so my advice to this person was, you need to stop serving in all these different places and narrow the focus. Give yourself fully to one team. Give yourself where every time that you can say yes to as many opportunities on that team. You can say yes to the relationships on that team. You could be at the team and you can give all of your energy and all of your gifts to that one team. Listen, if I just described you, you're trying to serve in 18,000 different places and be 18,000 different party parts, narrow the focus. Narrow the focus by choosing a primary ministry. One team to invest the best of your time and your energy and your focus and your heart into, and you say yes to that, yes to that, yes to that, those team opportunities. And you say yes to those relationships. You invest the best of yourself into them. Listen, when you do it, you will experience God using you to have a greater influence. And by the way, that's just more fun. By the way, it's a way to get to know people better. So for those of you who are serving, I'm so grateful for you. I'm so proud of you functioning as, functioning as the body of Christ. One more thing to those of you who are serving. Some of you who are, who are on teams, who are serving on teams, some of you have lost passion or interest or desire for the team that you're serving on. And you need to know there's nothing wrong with you. And there's nothing wrong with that team. Sometimes when you lose passion for a team, you start to like get critical of that team and get critical. There's nothing wrong with that team. If you're losing passion and interest and desire for that team you're serving on, it's just an indicator that it's time to not quit serving and detach yourself. Stay attached. Stay attached by transitioning. It's time to transition to serve on a different team. So don't feel guilty for losing passion. Talk to your team leader. But what it would look to, tra to transition off that team and then start engaging on a new team by signing up for Team Link. I'll talk more about Team Link in just a second. Now, for those of you who say that Relevant is your church, but you're not serving on a team, 
I want to challenge you to engage. Engage because you're hardwired to have influence. Engage because true purpose is found through positive influence. Engage because the greatest influence for me and you is found in we. Engage because we are the body of Christ together. And for us to have the greatest influence, we need you. We need every body part. Engage so that you don't start thinking of yourself more highly than you ought. And some of you go, yeah, but I'm not a follower of Christ. You know, I'm not sure I believe all this Jesus stuff. And, and listen, that's okay. awesome. You should still engage. Still engage. At Relevant, we have this phrase, belong before you believe. Which means you can engage and be engaged long before you believe, you know, what I believe or what you think we believe. You, you can belong even if you never believe. Like, be engaged. But let me just warn you. I just want to warn you, though. If that's you, be forewarned. By engaging and serving, it's probably going to affect your heart a little bit. And you might even have your heart opened up to Jesus a little bit more. So just be forewarned. Now, some of you, you used to serve on a team. But for a variety of reasons, you've disengaged from serving. You know, your, your feelings got hurt, so you disengaged. You didn't like that team, so you disengaged. You, you got lazy, so you disengaged. COVID happened, and you just couldn't be here and shouldn't be here. And, per, so, and, and you disengaged, and you just haven't reengaged since. You, you, you got busy, and, and so you disengaged. And my challenge to you, my challenge to you, if that's you, is to reengage. Re-engage because you're hardwired to have influence. Re-engage because true purpose is found through positive influence. Re-engage because the greatest influence from me and you is found in we. Re-engage because we are the body of Christ together. And for us to have the greatest influence, we need you, every body part. Re-engage so our body doesn't wear out. Now, COVID it was crazy, Right, and because of COVID, now we're a year and a half in or however stinking long, it seemed, seemed like forever. When, when COVID happened and because of where everyone's at comfort-wise, and you know, about half of our body parts stepped away and disengaged. And that's okay. Like that needed to happen. But today, from where we were before COVID, our body is still operating at about half capacity from where it was before COVID as far as like our body parts being engaged and serving. And through the last year and a half, so many people stepped up. You know, and knees chose to be elbows, and elbows chose to be hands, and feet chose to be neck, because they had to. For us to continue to operate over this last year, so many of you chose to step up. I'm so grateful for you. But as I just said, you can't keep doing that. And you need to know, because of that, because we're only operating... At half capacity, even before we were before COVID, our body is wearing out. And just like your physical body, if your physical body gets wore out, you can't operate at full capacity and have full influence. If our body is wore out, if our body is wore out, we can't have the influence for God's glory that he wants us to have. And you need to know, if this is you and you've disengaged and you're just laying there, Sooner or later, you become just a consumer. And that's okay for a season. But you consume long enough and consume and consume and consume and consume. And as a follower of Christ, not operate as a part of the body of Christ. What you end up doing is sucking life out of the body. If you love relevant and you're not serving, I challenge you to engage or re-engage. Engage for us, but mostly I challenge you to do it for you. When you don't serve, you start feeling unneeded. And when you feel unneeded, you feel unwanted. And when you feel unwanted, you disengage your heart. And when your heart disengages from the body, you start to become a decomposing body part. And not only does that hurt you, it hurts everyone around you. So my next step invitation for anyone who is not serving is to engage or re-engage by signing up for Team Link today. Team Link is an hour event to learn about different teams here at Relevant and how you can take a next step to engage. And you're not committing to any team. You're not committing to anything by signing up for Team Link. You're just committing to show up for this hour. And at this hour, you're going to learn about different teams. You're going to get an opportunity to, if you want to try a team on for a few months before you commit to that team.
And if some of you are going, well, I don't know if I want to, you know, come and serve in person or not. Good news, we're a church that is committed to be both equally digital and physical. So every single day, we have more digital serving opportunities where you never even have to show up in person. Kelly Sampson, one of my good friends, has served here at Relevant for a long time. She's on volunteer staff. She has served on our production team forever. Because of many circumstances, Kelly just cannot be here in person. Kelly serves digitally, and every single week, she puts the service sermon slides together that you see on all the screens so that, and, and I, we could not do it without Kelly. So there's these digital serving opportunities so you don't even have to show up in person. So Team Link's in a few weeks. It's on October 22nd, or excuse me, August 22nd at 2 p.m. It's in person and it's also online. So scan the QR code, go to the website, but engage or re-engage by signing up for Team Link today. Now let me just say this before I close out. Some of you, some of you, may already be coming up with reasons why you can't or won't engage by serving on a team. I'm not here to make you feel guilty. Guilt is not, never a good motivation. I'm not, I, I, if you don't, that's up to you. You're a grown person. You do what you want to do. I'm not here to make you feel guilty. But I do want to encourage you to pay attention to what you're telling yourself right now. If you say, oh, I just can't, I won't engage or engage, Ask yourself the question. Listen, for you, this is worth it for you. Are any of the reasons that I'm telling myself right now because of a me mentality? Are any of the reasons I'm telling myself right now because I'm thinking of myself more highly than I ought? And what I'm about ready to say next, it may be uncomfortable for you. It's probably going to make you mad at me. And the only reason I'm going to say it, listen, I don't like you being uncomfortable and I don't like people being mad at me. But I love you enough to say what I'm about ready to say to you. These are some indications that you're probably thinking of yourself more highly than you ought if you're telling yourself this right now. I'm too busy. As if you're the only freaking busy person in the world. I have too much going on in my life. And none of the rest of us do. We have nothing going on. So we have all the time in the world to serve. It's not convenient for me. Yep, the hundreds of other people that serve here at Relevant, it's always convenient for them. That's below me. Well, I got my feelings hurt before. I got my feelings hurt. Welcome to the club. You hurt my feelings every day. Listen, if I disengaged when I got my feelings hurt, I would have quit before we started this thing. Well, they won't do it my way. And I don't know that I can engage until they do it my way. Listen. If just for one second you think your reason for not engaging and serving on a team might be, might be because of a me mentality, would you please reconsider? Reconsider for you. Serving is the thing that breaks our pride because it's the thing that takes the focus off me. Reconsider for us. Listen, if you love relevant, we need you. All this stuff doesn't happen by accident. Reconsider for God's glory. Reconsider so that you and we can do what we're hardwired to do. You're hardwired to have influence. The greatest influence for me and you is found in we. So for the people who want to live with purpose and have the greatest possible positive influence, let me ask you, what step do you need to take to break free from a me mentality into a we one? And imagine if 100% of us took that step. Imagine the positive influence we would have together. Imagine the transforming work that God would do in us and through us. Imagine how much healthier our church would be. You are hardwired for so much influence potential. We are hardwired for so much influence potential. So let's not leave anything on the table. Let's reach our full potential individually and together. And I'm going to close in prayer and get you out of here. But before I do, let me just say, next week, I'm going to be specifically talking to young people. Old people like me, those of you who are, we're old. Uh, it's going to be great for us too. But young people like 25 and under, so middle school students, high school students, college age people, people in your early uh, 20s, um, I'm going to be specifically talking to you next week. And so be here next week uh, or get them here next week if, if you know them. Uh, get them out of bed. It's part of what I'm going to be talking about. 
So I'm getting out of stinking bed. Uh, so uh, that should be fun next week. Uh, let me pray. Dear Lord, um, this is ultimately about you and your glory. Um, so I pray that we don't make this about us. We don't make me the center. We continue to make you the center. I pray that we just, that we choose to take a next step with whatever it is that you're calling us into to have more of a we mentality instead of a me one. Be glorified through that. I pray we find more purpose through that. I pray transformation in our lives and in our church and through our church happens because of that. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen.